God designed us for life, an abundant life with him and with one another. But there's a problem. Someone has taken our life. Jesus said the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. We're missing out on life like God intended because we go looking for life in all the wrong places. But there is a solution to this problem. Jesus said he came so that we may have life and have it in abundance. That's why Cross United Church exists, to help people find life like God intended. We believe life like God intended happens when three things are united in our lives. When we're brought to God in wholehearted worship through the cross of Jesus Christ, when we're brought together in authentic community, when we're deployed on the joyful mission that God has for us in the world, we experience fullness of life. Life like God intended, united in wholehearted worship, authentic community, and joyful mission is why Cross United Church exists. Hey, Cross United, so glad you've joined us for this online message. I want to encourage you to turn or tap in your Bible or your app to John 13, 21 through 30. While you're doing that, I want to remind you to go to crossunited.org. There are two tabs for you to click there. The first is online check-in on the left-hand side of the top menu bar where you can uh, connect with us, let us know a little bit more about yourself, let us know ways we could be praying for you. Great way for you to get connected to our church, especially uh, if maybe you're tuning in and you're not a part of our church already. Also there in the menu bar, there is on the right-hand side a tab that says Give. That will take you to our secure online giving platform. We are a new church, and so we are sponsored and partnered with by people and churches from all over the nation, but we are also trying to become self-sustaining. And so if you consider yourself a part of the Cross United family or you just consider yourself a generous person, I encourage you to give and give generously. Here in John 13, we're continuing our study and our series in the book of life, and we're entering into this final discourse of Jesus, this long uh, conversation he has with his disciples from chapters 13 through 17 in the second half of the book leading up to the crucifixion. And we're going to see here uh, one of the most painful moments in the entire Bible. And it, it illustrates a a point that is one of the most painful parts of being a Christian and for me being a pastor, and that is living life with people, uh, fellowshipping with people, connecting with people, um, get, getting really, really close to people, talking about Christ with people, seeing people express love and joy in Christ and to seem to have the fruit of the Spirit and are interested in the same spiritual things and are passionate about the same mission who then walk away or run away. And, and they, they, they depart the faith. They, they get out of their marriages. They, they post pictures of themselves on Instagram doing all sorts of things that, that would not please the heart of Christ. This is one of the most difficult things that I experience as a pastor more times than I would care to recount, and I'm sure if you've walked with Jesus and with others for any length of time, you could tell similar stories of those who seem to be all in with you, with Christ, and have walked away. Well, this is exactly the situation that Jesus and the disciples found themselves in, in John 13, 21. Um, they, they, they talk about this moment in the throughout the Gospels, and you can tell that the pain for them is still raw in that moment as they talk about Judas, and they, they make editorial comments that, that this was the one who would betray Jesus. And John earlier in John 12 says that, that Judas was actually a, a pretender, a liar, and a thief the whole time. The shock, the sadness, the fury that they felt that this friend who this this one who had seemed to be a brother with them this follower uh, of Jesus with them had betrayed them had betrayed him had betrayed their rabbi their friend their messiah their god in today's text we see this situation develop we see how Judas uh, falls into this situation. We see the, the lies of the satanic influence that led him astray, and we, from the rest of the biblical testimony, see uh, the pattern that is at work here and the warning that it gives to us about 
taking care to check ourselves and our own faith. We're going to learn in this text three things about falling away when those who seem to be Christians fall away. And we're going to be confronted with a warning. We're going to be confronted with a question. Are we going to be like the disciple who Jesus loved, who leaned into Jesus in friendship and love, or are we going to be like Judas, who betrayed Jesus? That's the question that presents itself to us in these verses here in 1321. When Jesus had said this, he was troubled in his spirit. Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples started looking at one another, uncertain which one he was speaking about. One of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close beside Jesus. Simon Peter motioned to him to find out who it was he was talking about. So he leaned back against Jesus and asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus replied, He's the one I give the piece of bread to after I have dipped it. When he had dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son. After Judas ate the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Jesus told him, What you're doing, do quickly. None of those reclining at the table knew why he had said this to him. Since Judas kept the money bag, some thought that Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. After receiving the piece of bread, he immediately left, and it was night. The first thing we see in this text is that falling away hurts the human heart of Christ. Back in verse 21, when Jesus said this, he was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Jesus could be troubled in spirit, disturbed, sad, because he was truly human. Um, Craig Keener, a Bible scholar, says that John underlines Jesus' emotions, even though some of his contemporaries would have viewed it as a mark of weakness. And it's the same today, right, where men aren't supposed to show their emotions. But here we see the, the greatest man showing his emotion. He was disturbed. He was distressed. He was troubled. He was sad that this one that he loved... This one who had followed him and walked with him was about to betray him. How can Jesus be disturbed? Because God, God can't be disturbed. God is perfect. He, he doesn't have emotional changes. He's fully and always eternally who he is. He, he can't become sad or happy in the sense that we can. He is fully himself all of the time. He doesn't change in his attitudes, his actions, or his emotions. He is God. So how could Jesus have a disturbed state of emotional stress? Well, it's because he was truly a human. There were certain teachers in the early days of the church that uh, wrestled with what the Bible teaches about Jesus. And, and, and a number of them, trying to understand, taught wrong things, things the Bible doesn't teach. One guy's name was Apollinaris, where he taught that Jesus had a human body, but did not have a human soul or spirit. But the Bible clearly shows that Jesus was fully human, body, soul, and spirit. The, the creed the church wrote in the 5th century in 451 in Chalcedon in modern day Turkey says that Jesus uh, had a human body and a human soul, that he was exactly like us in his human nature. In his divine nature, he is fully God. In his human nature, he is fully and truly human. But he was emotionally disturbed differently than we are in this sense, that we, we are overpowered by our emotions, but Jesus was in power over his emotions. Augustine said he was troubled not by a weakness of mind, but by power, in order that not despairing of salvation may arise for us when we are troubled, not by power, 
but by weakness. In other words, Jesus was in full control of his emotions, and it was appropriate to be sad in that moment, and so sad he indeed was. Um, as much as conversations with people and seeing Facebook posts and Instagrams, um, Instagram that, that I just see people walking away from the Lord, as much as it hurt, it's my heart, it hurts the human heart of Christ so much more. After all, he's the one who gave his life for the church. He's the one who bought the church with his blood. And if, if it makes me sad, if it makes you sad to see Christians or those we thought were Christians falling away, how much more does it hurt the human heart of Christ. He grieves when he sees formerly seemingly faithful followers fall away. Those who fall away, they grieve his heart, but it doesn't, unlike us, shock him or surprise him. He knew G Judas would betray him. He knew it ahead of time. He knew it because in his divine nature, he, had, he knew all things. He was omniscient, all-knowing, but he also knew it because it was foretold in the scripture that he as God inspired in the Old Testament. Psalm 49, 41 verse 9 says, Even my friend in whom I trusted, one who ate my bread, has raised his heel against me. He sensed the impending departure, the impending betrayal. And this, this man, who he had just moments before washed his feet, was about to betray him. Second, falling away discourages Christians who faithfully follow Christ. So the disciples started looking at one another, uncertain which one he was speaking about. One of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close beside Jesus. Simon Peter motioned to him to find out who it was he was talking about. So he leaned back against Jesus and asked him, Lord, who is it? So, so the, the disciples here are seated probably in a, the shape of a, of a U in, in what is called the triclinium, where there's a, a, a low table and then there's a, a, a couch at the front and then everyone kind of circled around it. And most likely Jesus was at the head with the beloved disciple who we know from other parts of the scripture are in later in the book of John is John who's telling us this story. And then next to him on the other side was Judas. And so we're seeing here that there is this contrast set up between Judas and John, between the beloved disciple and the betraying disciple. And as as Jesus says this, the disciples are perplexed, they're disturbed, they're discouraged, and they want to know what's going on. And we see here that they, they start asking what's going on, and, and Peter was, was, was wanting to know, so he, he reaches out and nods over to the one Jesus loved who was reclining beside Jesus. There in verse 23, it says he was reclining close beside Jesus, literally in his chest. Now, the only other time this phrase is used is in John 1.18, where it says that no one has ever seen God, the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side or in the chest or the lap of the Father, he has revealed him. And what we see here is that this beloved disciple is faintly portraying the eternal love of the Father for the Son. He, he is leaning into the relationship he has with Jesus, not in some sort of sexual way that, that some may try to claim anachronistically, saying, oh, this was some sort of uh, homosexual thing. This was not, this was a cultural practice that would have been understood in that day, much like many cultures today express male friendship and affection very differently than we would see. Uh, we are so um, overly sexualized in our culture that we, we tend to see things that are just not there. This was simply a close friendship, a friendship of love and closeness. This disciples leaning in to the heart of Christ. This is, this is the point. He's leaning in to the heart of Christ. And all of the disciples, Peter included at the forefront, want to know who Jesus is talking about. And here we see, I think, 
that if you're concerned about betraying Jesus or falling away from Jesus or committing the unforgivable sin, you're probably in a fairly healthy spiritual place. Scripture says we should test ourselves to see whether we're in the faith in 1 Corinthians 13, 5. And our recent men's Bible study, we talked about Paul the Apostle having ministered for a decade and a half, went into the apostles in Jerusalem and he said to, to be sure that I had not run in vain. It's good to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. It's, it's good to check in. It's good to question once in a while and take assessment and take stock. And these disciples, they, they wanted to make sure that they were not the one who was going to betray Jesus. As Thomas Aquinas notes in his commentary on this passage, though they sensed nothing in their heart of, that they would betray Jesus, they trusted what Jesus said more than their own heart. So they thought, no, no, it can't be me. Who is it? Because shipwrecked faith discourages and hurts the church and those who faithfully follow Jesus. They, they see this and they're, they're shocked, they're saddened, and they're discouraged. And we, we, we go through the same thing, don't we? I bet you know people, like I do, who you talked and prayed and walked with in the, in the way of Christ, who have gone far beyond the narrow way. As a pastor, I get a front row seat into the spiritual lives of so many. And the, the beauty of that is seeing the, the flourishing and the spiritual growth. The hard part of that is seeing those who fall away. Don't walk away. Don't hurt the ones you love. Don't discourage the church. And if someone you know and love is walking in a dangerous direction, come alongside them and pray for them. Another church in the early days of the Christian move it, movement dealt with this. And it was actually a church. John, who wrote this gospel, was one of the, the spiritual leaders of, one of, the, one of the, the pastors of the apostles for this church. And, and he writes this about this church where this group of people had departed the faith, had denied the truth. He says this, 1 John 2.19, he wrote this letter to this church. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. As discouraging as it is when seemingly faithful followers fall away, God is using that to purify his church, separating the wheat from the chaff, the sheep from the goats. We're going to see in just a minute the way Jesus expels Judas. He sends him out of the fellowship because what he's about to say to the disciples should only be said in the company of those who are truly committed to him. So it's discouraging, it's okay to be discouraged and sad, and we should be checking our own hearts, but to know that God has a purpose. Then finally, third, we see this sobering warning. Falling away destroys the one who abandons Christ. They ask him who it is, and Jesus replied, He's the one I give the piece of bread to after I have dipped it. When he had dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son. And after Judas ate the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Took, so he, he, Judas just yields to satanic influence and lies here. So Jesus told him, what you're doing, do quickly. None of those reclining at the table knew why he said this to him. Since Judas kept the money bag, so you have to understand there, when it says Judas kept the money bag, he was elected treasurer of this group. He, that means he was considered one of, if not the most trustworthy men among them. The one they thought least likely 
to skim coins from the purse. He kept the purse, the money bag, and some thought Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival or that he would give something to the poor. After receiving the piece of bread, he immediately left. And it was night. Betraying Jesus destroyed Judas. As hurtful as it was to the human heart of Christ and as discouraging as it was to the remaining faithful, it was absolutely catastrophic for him, for Judas. He fell away, but even worse, Jesus expels him. What you have to do, do quickly. Jesus says, get out. Depart from me, for I never knew you, you worker of wickedness. It's a terrifying thought. So what happened? What happened? Did Judas lose his salvation? Did, did he somehow have a true relationship with Christ and then fall away from it? Well, throughout the scripture, we see this topic addressed. Can a follower of Jesus fall away? Can a Christian lose their salvation? And we have some passages in Hebrews that are sometimes brought in to the discussion. I'll read a couple of them for you. For it is impossible to renew to repentance those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away. This is because to their own harm, they are re-crucifying the Son of God and holding him up to contempt. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. On into Hebrews 10. For we, if we deliberately go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. Anyone who disregarded the law of Moses died without mercy based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think one will deserve who has trampled on the Son of God, who has regarded as profane the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has in insulted the Spirit of grace? So what's happening? Can a true believer lose their salvation? Well, the answer to that question is no. That God uses warnings to preserve the faithful and that those who fall away were never truly followers in the first place. The scripture makes very clear, for example, John 6, 37, as we saw earlier in this narrative, Jesus says, everyone the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. And what he means there is the one who comes to me in truth and in heart, the one who comes to me genuinely. So all along, no matter what it seemed like on the surface, Judas was never wholeheartedly following Christ. He was part of the crowd, but not part of the committed other scriptures confirm this as well. Philippians 1.6, one of my favorite verses. I'm sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So, so scripture is clear. True followers do not fall away. And those who fall away were not true followers. They couldn't have been because Jesus keeps his own. So these warnings then are intended to remind us to stay faithful. As puzzling as this is and as difficult as this is to consider, the answer is back in the verse we just looked at from 1 John. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belongs to us. In the fellowship of the faithful, tares grow among the wheat and goats mingle among the sheep. And you can't always tell which is which until the time of testing. Often it takes time to discern who's true 
and who's not. And you can't just take a snapshot of a person's life in a certain moment or season. You can't take someone's worst moment and extrapolate that into their lifetime. You can't take someone's best moment and, and assume that's their whole life. You have to look at the trajectory of a person's life. And, it, and, and as a Christian yourself, you have to take care. Scripture says, whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. So the call to you is don't be Judas. Don't fall away. Stick with Jesus. And if you have fallen away, if you've wandered from the path, if you're in a difficult time, come back. While you have breath in your lungs, you still have time on the clock. Jesus will receive you and take you and forgive you. Though a righteous person falls seven times, he will get up. But the wicked will stumble into ruin. Proverbs 24, 16. This is a discouraging and could be terrifying. This, this, this story can discourage us and can scare us. But what it really should be doing is encouraging us and challenging us and confronting us with this question. Will we be like the beloved disciple leaning into the heart of Christ or will we be like Judas the betrayer taking a morsel of bread from Christ and I think that's basically what it boils down to are you with Jesus are you following him for what he can give to you or for who he is do you want Jesus for who he is or simply what he gives? As an old cliche says it, do you want to see his face or just receive from his hand? Now, obviously, there are immeasurable and innumerable blessings and grace that, that come to him, to those who love him. But the question is, who and what are you seeking him for? When I was in high school and college, there was a, a one-hit wonder song by a band called The Blessed Union of Souls. And some of you who are old enough may remember this. And it was called Hey Leonardo. And the song was, She Likes Me For Me. She doesn't care about my car. She doesn't care about my money. She likes me for me. Not because I look like Tyson Beckford or with the charm of Robert Redford oozing out my ears. She don't care about my big screen or my collection of DVDs. Things like that just never mattered much to her. She doesn't watch too much TV. She look, likes me for me. And the question is, are you following Jesus for Jesus? like the beloved disciple leaning into his heart? Or are you following Jesus like Judas to use him to get something from his hand? 